I'm here today, I'm gonna, I want to talk about uh, space exploration challenges that are still in front of us as we go forward. Uh, we've solved a lot of them in the past, but there's a couple of key ones that we still haven't solved, and uh, I would say we need your help to do that. So that's what I'm here today to talk about. Um, as I was growing up, as I was a young boy uh, many years ago, um, I saw a number of major accomplishments that NASA achieved over the years. And the biggest one for me was uh, 1962, was when John Glenn orbited, uh, orbited the Earth. That was huge for me. I was about 10 years old, and that really changed my life. Uh, and I ended up, obviously, here I am today, I'm working at John H. Glenn Research Center. So that was a huge thing for me. And, um, and then after that point in time, uh, we, uh, uh, after we orbited the Earth, then we uh, went to the moon in 69, and that was a huge event. How do we get a person to the moon and get them back and all that? How do we just go about doing that? So that was a huge, and I think NASA had like, I don't know how many thousands of people working, but thousands working on that job, and we accomplished that. And then in the 70s, we uh, put, started to put together the space shuttle, because we wanted to be able to shuttle things to low Earth orbit lower Earth orbit, and we wanted to do it on a regular basis, two, three, four, or five times a year, and we tried to keep that rate up. And, uh, and so we did that, and as everybody knows, we just decommissioned the shuttle. Now, uh, the station, and then in the 90s, uh, in the 90s with the shuttle, we built the space station, which sits up there now and produces about 100, 100 kilowatts of power, and there's three to four astronauts on the station at all times. So, those are huge things that we did. And what we need to do, I mean, the goal always was to push people out into deep space. And what I want to talk about today is there's a couple of challenges that we have uh, that are, are, are hitting us that we, we're having difficulty moving forward and, and getting those challenges solved and moving us forward. I wanted to start out with this picture. This is a picture of Saturn uh, taken by the Cassini spacecraft. Okay, and the Cassini spacecraft is being uh, darkened by Saturn. So it's your, just imagine you're on, you're on the other side of Saturn and you're looking at it, you're looking at the rings, and on the other side of Saturn is the sun, okay? And so that spacecraft was launched in 1997. It is still out there today, still taking this, these kinds of images and producing that kind of data. And uh, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little dot out to the upper left-hand corner there in the ring, near a little colored spot there. That's the Earth, okay, in that image. So it's amazing, you know, we launched it in 1997. I think it took eight, seven or eight years to get to Saturn, and those are the kind of images we're able to bring back with the technology we've got. So that's, the kind of, that's what we can be seeing out there if we were out there today. I mean, that's the main point. Um, what are the challenges? This is a little technical, but uh, I thought it's, it's very important. One of the things this, this, this curve shows is how little solar power there is out beyond Jupiter, okay, when you get to Saturn. When you go beyond Jupiter, there, you basically have zero solar power. So this is one of the problems that we have in going out past Mars. You can see on Mars, We've sent uh, rovers to Mars, and they're solar-powered, and we've managed to uh, run them around Mars and things like that, and now we, now we have another rover there that's nuclear-powered. But when you start getting out and start exploring space, you, you just can't accomplish what you want to do with the current, the current technology we have today. So we've got we've to use the technologies we've got, and we've got to keep pushing out. Uh, one of the ways we did Cassini, this Cassini spacecraft, is we do it with radioisotopes. And we have radioisotopes that, when they, there's a radioactive decay process, and when they decay, they give off a lot of heat. And that, that little glowing red pellet there on the right there is a natural radioactive decay of an isotope. Because we concentrate the isotope, and then we put it on a, uh, a photo, uh, thermoelectric device. So we put it on a couple, and then we generate, we just basically generate, the temp get a temperature difference between deep space and that hot pellet, and we gener generate a DC current from that. And uh, the rover in the middle of that uh, picture there is the uh, Curiosity rover, 
And I don't know if you probably can't see it, but on the back of that rover is, uh, is one of our, our radioisotope power systems. Okay, so it's sitting there producing power, produces about 110 watts of power. That's what, how the rover is enabled to uh, survive. And it doesn't just provide power, it also provides heat, because there's not enough heat out there as well. So one of the ways we get at our, uh, one of the technologies that we use is radioisotope power system, because uh, this rover is a lot more efficient, a lot more effective, and it can go day and night and all that, uh, where the solar-powered rovers couldn't do it. So that, that's one of the technologies that we're, we're pushing out. Uh, this chart shows um, some of the uh, missions we've run. I, I mentioned Cassini. Uh, we have a Mars 2020 mission coming up in, 20, obviously, 2020, uh, the Curiosity rover. And then some people, I'm sure people have heard about the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 spacecraft. Those are also radioisotope power system missions. And they're still out there. They're just starting to go through the heliosphere and sending back data to us. So this is just gives you an idea of the kinds of missions we're able to do and how many we've done over the years. We've just done so many. And a, we, we used radioisotopes on Apollo as well. Uh, they carried them out on Apollo. And, and those missions are reflected here. And we use them for orbit, flyby, roving, and landing. So we use them in all kinds of different, uh, they provide all kinds of different capabilities. Uh, this is a picture of the rover again, of the uh, Curiosity rover. Like I said, it's, uh, it's about 110 watts of power and uh, constant power. But look at the efficiency for thermoelectrics. It's only about 6% efficient. So that's just, I mean, the amount of kilowatts per kilogram is just very low. It's about 2 kilowatts uh, per kilogram for, the RP, for this rover. So that's the current state of the art that we have here. Uh, what I've been working on recently uh, are some new concepts, as Meredith said. We've got a, a new device, which is a Stirling engine. It's a dynamic device, and we can generate basically four times the power with the same amount of radioactive heat, radioactive decay heat. So it's much safer, much, everything's better. It's a much more efficient system. And then um, finally, um, you know, your house, your house that you live in, you've got about 15 uh, kilowatts in your house. That's what you need in your house to live. And you can see, I'm building uh, systems, I'm sending systems out to deep space that are only 100 or 120 watts or so. I can't live on 120 watts. So I need to have larger systems. So the only system, if, if we're going to go out beyond Jupiter and, to, and explore the solar system, we've got to come up with, with higher power systems. And the only system we've been able to come up with that can provide that kind of power density is uh, reactor systems, basically, nuclear reactor systems. But up to this point in time, there's a lot of uh, political and all kinds of other challenges associated and safety challenges associated with flying uh, reactors. So we haven't actually demonstrated that cap capability at all. So right now, we're limited to doing things between here and the moon uh, and here in Mars and fairly low power, you know, 100, couple hundred watts, that kind of thing, those kinds of missions. So, so that's, that's one of the challenges, and that's why we're working on these dynamic systems. The other, the other big challenge we have is just radiation in space. Um, there's a field of radiation out there, high energy ions, electrons, all kinds of charged particles, and they're just everywhere. And uh, this is showing the uh, magnetic protection that the Earth provides to these particles. So we're sitting here on Earth, and we have this protection system around us, and uh, the particles can't get to us because, uh, uh, and, and then we're, we're uh, effectively uh, shielded from that. So the problem is when we go out into deep space, these particles are everywhere, and there's a, a tremendous number of them, and, and we have, uh, they affect our electronics, and they affect us. So the, one of the biggest problems we have is what's the effect on us as we travel to deep space, and how do we protect ourselves? So I wanted to put this in um, when the Mars Science Laboratory traveled to Mars uh, last year and landed last year. The, the, the last, couple of, uh, last couple of bars on this chart are, are, are radiation dose, okay? They measured radiation dose on the way to Mars, and it took them about six months. And then there's another, the red bar on there is the 500 days on Mars. So if you take the, the bars that show 
if it takes you six months to get to Mars, and you spend 500 days on Mars, and then you spend uh, 100, 180 more days coming back, if you add up just those last two bars on that curve, on the, on that, in that curve there, you end up with a dose that is deadly, to, you know, that's not, that's not healthy for humans. I wouldn't say deadly, but bad, not good news. Because you, <laughs> you can see the comparisons here for the other things, so the space station and things like that. So we need to solve that problem. We need to solve how we protect ourselves if we're going to do these missions to Mars and other places in deep space. And we do not have the answer for this yet. This is one of the things we just don't have the answer. And we also haven't demonstrated the power capability that we need out there to live and survive in, in deep space, to have the habitation. Because like I said, you need 15 to 30 kilowatts. That's why the station has 100 kilowatts on it, because you use about 25 all the time. And if you're sitting on the station, you, you want to have that backup. I mean, you don't, <laughs> you want another 25 and another 25 and another 25 because, you know, you just saw they had that pump problem on station and they lost some, some of their cooling on half of the station. So you, you want to have that other half of the station still running and, you're, and then you're cooling it so that you have that redundancy. So you need that kind of, you need the same kind of thing that we have on the station out in deep space. So what I wanted to leave you with um, is we need to figure out this, uh, how we're going to accomplish these deep space missions as, a, as, a nation, as NASA and as a nation and you folks out there. It's not going to be in my generation. It's not going to happen from what I see. So the way to solve the radiation problem uh, is we need shorter exposure time, really, and we need, uh, and we need shielding, okay? Now, there are ways to get shorter exposure time, which is you travel faster. But how do you travel faster? And we're having, you know, there's, you can use chemical, but then how do you replenish when you get out there and so forth? So it's very difficult to do. So nu there's nuclear thermal, and then there's ion engines and things like that. But it turns out, uh, from what we've looked at, that the ion engines just don't pro provide the kind of impulse we need to get out there in a hurry. Because we'd like to shorten the time to, to, to Mars to uh, 30 days or so like six times faster. And we don't know how to, we don't have the systems in place to do that today. So we, the main thing we need to do is we need to demonstrate something that gives us that capability as we move forward here. That's the, that's the dream that we just keep moving forward and keep pushing out. So how do we do that? And right now there, there's nothing on the books that says here, this is what we're gonna do, this is how we're gonna get there. So uh, the other thing, uh, the radiation challenge is such a big challenge for us. We don't know what to do with it. Uh, we have a uh, website that's been set up, and it's the NASA Exploration Design Challenge for Radiation. And they're asking all of you at this website, they're asking all of you to participate. And it, it, it goes through K through 12. K through 12, college students, whoever's out there, NASA, and, and we're all looking for ideas for how we solve that problem for deep space exploration. How do we protect ourselves? How do we shield ourselves? What are the mechanisms? What are the new ideas that could come our way where we could do that? So we need that data, we need that information from whoever's got it, any, any new ideas people have. And then we're gonna go ahead and, well, won't be me, but the, we'll go ahead and implement those ideas in the future. So that's what I wanna leave you with is, we have major challenges to keep our dream alive of exploring deep space and radiation and power. We need to come up with some demonstrations and do those demonstrations in the next couple of decades so that we can keep uh, pursuing our dreams out in the deep space. That's all I have.